Good evening and welcome to the New Bugaiski Hour from Washington, D.C. I would like to thank Voice of America for hosting the Washington episodes of my show for RTK. And today I will be discussing transatlanticism and Balkan security with our special guest on the Bugaiski hot seat, Ralph Bayrovich, co-chairman of the U.S.-Europe Alliance in Washington, D.C. But first, my political commentary on a key international topic is entitled Corruption Destroys Democracy. The new Transparency International Corruption Perception Index reveals that the Balkan countries continue to decline in global rankings. The results show a close correlation between state corruption, democratic regress and economic stagnation. Transparency International findings not the only measure of corruption. The World Bank periodically issues papers that paint a bleak picture in most of the Balkans. Such reports confirm that corruption corrodes and destroys the three pillars of a healthy state, the political system, the economy, and the social structure. Systematic corruption among government officials, a politicized public administration, and a bribery-prone judicial system deform states. Public sector corruption takes many forms, whether in illicit party funding, unregulated flows of private and foreign money to officials, or kickbacks from awarding government contracts. Just as professional criminals are often one step ahead of the police, corrupt officials avoid detection by finding novel ways to channel state funds to their cronies and relatives. The political system is also damaged by clampdowns on the free media, threats against journalists, and limitations on civic organizations that monitor state corruption. A corrupt government always seeks to preserve its rule so officials can continue to benefit from the state treasury and a new administration does not conduct legal procedures against them. Corruption also undermines developing economies through a distorted form of crony capitalism. It impedes investment as foreign businessmen avoid extortion and uncertainty. This has serious consequences on economic growth and job creation. The World Bank has clear evidence that countries successfully combating corruption attract more investment and grow more rapidly. Social bonds also suffer under prolonged corruption. In developing democracies, corruption erodes public trust in the government. This is especially damaging in polarized states where corruption perpetuates inequalities and discontent can lead to extremism and violence. During the last year, anti-corruption movements across the globe have gained momentum, with millions of people staging protests. In many countries, citizens experience petty bribery on a daily basis, where access to public services such as healthcare and education is often blocked. Social frustration erodes confidence in political leaders, elected officials, and in democracy itself. Despite its own problems with corruption, the United States has developed antidotes, including a free media, independent civic organizations, and an uncorrupted legal system. But even America's democracy cannot be taken for granted and must be constantly guarded against the temptations of power. Young democracies in the Balkans need particular defending so that corrupt and authoritarian temptations do not prevail. It is time now for the Bugajski Hot Seat with Ralph Bayrovich, co-chairman of the US-Europe Alliance here in Washington, D.C. Welcome to the show, Ralph. Thank you very much. Can you start by, uh, I always do this, uh, tell, tell our viewers about your organization. Uh, I gather the US-Europe Alliance is a fairly new mm -hmm. initiative here in D.C. So tell us a little bit about its objectives, its activities, its outreach program, and so forth. Well, U.S.-Europe Alliance is focused on uh, the U.S. So the idea is to get the Americans to understand the importance of um, strategic alliance between the U.S. and Europe. So we go around the country, mostly you know rural areas and areas that are uh, often forgotten when it comes to foreign policy stuff, uh -huh. um, and we tell people, 
what, what, a, what a beautiful alliance we had with Europe the last 75 years and how important it is for the U.S. to keep it going. So uh, we talk about NATO. We say what, you know, the interest of the U.S. is in keeping NATO alive. Uh, we tell people how important it is to have uh, the European Union do as much as possible in terms of security, mm -hmm. uh, how it helps the U.S. economy continue trading with Europe. Uh, we also talk about culture a little bit. Uh, but most of our work is really focused on, on the, the heartland of America, so to say, mostly the Midwest. The Midwest, particularly the states that are, <coughs> let's say, swing states during the elections as well. Exactly, exactly. But, but also states with large Central East European populations. Exactly. So uh, I was just in Iowa. Uh, I was there for the caucuses, and I was there to talk to American people mm -hmm. and a lot of the Democrats about, because I'm a Democrat, so the organization is, mm -hmm. is a bipartisan organization. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are Republicans <coughs> and there are Democrats, and I went to talk to people during before the primaries about how important it is that we uh, understand that um, any uh, trouble in Europe of any kind mm -hmm. is uh, very detrimental to U.S. interests mm -hmm. and uh, is probably the most uh, dangerous outcome in terms of how we keep our economy going the way it's going right now. What are the qu questions you have that they have about uh, NATO, about Europe? Uh, do you find that, how sophisticated are they, how knowledgeable? It, it, you'd be surprised. Mm -hmm. uh, the American people in general are very interested in foreign affairs, I'd mm -hmm. say. Um, and people are very aware of what goes on in the world. Um, there's a lot of sort of uh, feeling of, of neglect by people in, in the, you know, sort of Midwest in terms of uh, the debate about foreign policy. And foreign mm -hmm. policy debate in, in America, and this is something I think we can both agree on as Americans, is very centered, very D.C. centered, right? Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of the uh, main thinkers, a lot of the sort of think tanks, uh, the government is here. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's some stuff in New York, right? right. Th there's some prominent universities and the U.N. is in New York. Exactly. But in terms of how we as Americans view foreign policy, I think 90 percent of the debate is here. And um, it's interesting that people really are hungry for, for uh, you know, foreign policy issues to be discussed mm -hmm. face to face with them. Um, there is a bit of uh, bitterness, I must say, about the Europeans' uh, unwillingness to come up with uh, sufficient funds, for example, for NATO. Mm -hmm. lot, you, you sometimes hear people the say... The sort of thing that Trump has been, uh, uh, let's say, berating the Europeans about. Well, I'm, I'm a Democrat, right? So mm -hmm. I, I, I can say this, uh, and I think it's credible when I say it. Um, the American people agree that the Europeans have to do more when it comes to defense. Mm -hmm. Uh, the question you often ask, you, you often hear from people, well, why are the Germans paying uh, less than 1% of their GDP for defense, mm -hmm. so 0.7%, and we're paying over 4, 4.5%, four and, and they can get to have a free health care and a free uh, child care for mm -hmm. their you know, children, while we have to pay for their defense and have to pay more for health care, more mm -hmm. for child care, right? So that's the connection people yeah. make. Yeah, yeah. And it could be because the president <coughs> that we have has talked about it for years now, and, uh, but it also could be that people have figured it out. So I think the Europeans have to understand that this alliance will really uh, prosper as mm -hmm. long as they really uh, start spending money. Although the, Trump also simplifies things because it's not just a question of the percentage, it's what you spend it on. For instance, in Greece, they spend, what, two-something, point three or four percent. A lot of that goes on um, welfare payments to veterans. And, I mean, it's all included in defense spending. It depends on what you spend on weaponry and capabilities. Plus, of course, in countries like Germany, they pay a lot for hosting American troops and American bases. And well, I mean, <laughs> Germany pays a lot for, for uh, its defense overall. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a huge amount of money because Germany is a big co economy, right? Sure. But they'll, the, the, the most often response you get from the Germans is that it's not 0.7%, it's 1.2%. Mm -hmm. Well, it's 1.2% because of exactly what you said. They think that military pensions count as defense as yeah. expenditure, right. which, which I think is, is, not, is not the right way to go right. about it. And, of course, America has bigger, let's say, it's not the only fish to fry. Europe is not the only fish to fry. That's why its defense spending is so high. America is involved in many countries around the world, Korea and Middle East, of course, and elsewhere. But let us uh, tell us a little bit uh, about your background, Ralph. Uh, how did you end up in Washington? Where did, where, did you, where did you come from? How did you get here? Well, my story is really quintessentially American. So mm -hmm. I came here in 1994 uh, as a refugee. 
Uh, I was a refugee in Turkey, in Istanbul. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm originally from Sarajevo. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother got me out right at the beginning of the war. I was 15 years old. Mm -hmm. And we became um, essentially illegal Im illegals in, in Turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, we stayed there for two and a half years. My father got out of the war and we uh, were accepted uh, in America as refugees. So I lived in Louisville, Kentucky. So I'm originally ah, from, when I, people okay. here ask me where I'm from, I say I'm from Louisville. <laughs> so, uh, so you're I, a bourbon specialist. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, more of basketball specialist. Okay. You know, University of Louisville is my alma mater and we're right. really, uh, you know, big, big in basketball. So uh, that's, that's, that's my story really in terms of how I became American. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, having been, uh, you know, very uh, affected by the war, uh, I thought that it would be uh, my, my role, my role in life to try to do as much as I can in Bosnia. So, mm -hmm. I went back to Bosnia and did a lot of, um, a lot of political work, so to say. Mm -hmm. uh, I was involved in several campaigns, um, most notably the 2010 campaign when SDP won the uh, plurality of the vote, the only time <coughs> in the Social uh, Democrats, uh, yeah. yeah, Social Democrats, mm -hmm. it's 111 year history now. Uh, then I ended up being a Minister of Energy of Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, which is by far the biggest portfolio in, in mm -hmm. the country. It's mm -hmm. over almost, I think, $2 billion turnover a year for all the com 26 companies. It's, it's a, essentially half of the uh, state-owned economy mm -hmm. uh, of the country. So uh, I did a lot of you know, political stuff. I, mm -hmm. But I was here as well at the same time. Mm -hmm. I um, worked extensively on uh, the Balkans, of course, in Washington. and. Uh, uh, on the Middle East, especially Syria. Uh, I led a think tank for uh, several years before I became minister, which uh, dealt with the uh, Middle East and the <coughs> Balkans. The idea mm -hmm. was to have the Balkans post-conflict uh, experiences, post-conflict, post-authoritarian experiences mm -hmm. be uh, some sort of a um, uh, ha knowledge hub for people in the Middle East. That mm -hmm. At that time, this is when the Arab Spring was still uh, well and alive, that they could draw on, on some of the experiences from the Balkans. Uh, and, you know, I've, I've worked on several issues relating to Europe as well for many years. Uh, you know, worked as a consultant for many of the uh, big organizations mm -hmm. that have to de deal with democracy promotion. Many private companies I was mm -hmm. involved in, right. negotiations on big energy projects and so on. Uh, but my passion really is um, the Balkans. I mean, let's, let's just be honest about it. And uh, I feel like people in the Balkans can have uh, peaceful and a and, uh, stable pro future only if the U.S. is involved. Mm -hmm. I think especially, uh, this is something people often don't talk about, but the Muslim populations of the Balkans, basically the Bosniaks mm -hmm. and the Albanians, mm -hmm. have one true long-standing ally, and it's the United States of America. And this, is, uh, this has proven to be the case in the 90s. Mm -hmm. uh, the Albanians, especially my, my friends in Kosovo, mm -hmm. um, got saved by the American military action uh, because America does not see the European Muslims first as Muslims, it sees them first as humans, mm -hmm. which I think is unique to America. I think that a lot of our European <laughs> friends, despite their being Europeans who are different, right? Mm -hmm. The governments used to see us primarily as Muslims. So yeah. you, there's this famous um, book called The Clinton Tapes. I'm sure you've read mm -hmm. it where President Clinton, this was right before 9-11, so, so it sort of got forgotten because of the new reality we live in since 9-11. Sure. But <laughs> there's a quote in the book where he says that uh, Francois Mitterrand and the Brits told him that in 93 that he shouldn't intervene because Bosnia as a Muslim state would not belong in Europe. Mm -hmm. And the French officials yeah. even called it the natural but ugly but natural restoration of Christian Europe. I mean, th th those are realities yeah. we faced 30 years ago, right? So that's why I think that the, keeping America, which I think is an honest broker in the world in general, is very important for both Albanians and the Bosnians. Very good points. Uh, Ralph, tell us a little bit about this paper. You recently co-authored a paper for the U.S.-Europe Alliance <coughs> proposing a new Anglo-American partnership uh, for the West Balkans. Can you outline the main points? Well, the idea is that the Brexit is really uh, <coughs> an opportunity because Britain uh, for a number of years has been, uh, I think since Blair, basically since, since Tony Blair seized power, Britain has been a uh, benevolent actor in the Balkans mostly. Mm -hmm. uh, and Britain is, is, a, is a type of power that can act in a more direct manner, has a tradition of acting in a more direct manner than some of the uh, continental European powers. 
So the fact that Britain has left the EU doesn't mean that Britain has <coughs> left Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, and talking to some of my friends in the British government and friends here in, in government, we realize that there's appetite for some sort of action, right? So Britain is going to have to show and is going to uh, show that it's still uh, willing to get engaged in the European uh, mm -hmm. uh, affairs. Mm -hmm. And the Balkans is in Europe. So the idea that we have is that uh, after Macron's no, in October, yeah. uh, that there's a mm -hmm. void now that people are, especially those making decisions, the elite is uh, disoriented in many ways, right? If, if we, I mean, we've been, we've been uh, <coughs> as, as a region going to Europe for 20 years, and now that there's no Europe, no European integration, what do we do, right? Mm -hmm. Do we turn to Russia? Do we turn to China? And the Russians and Chinese are very interested in the region for, for different reasons. The R Russians want to cause chaos. The Chinese want to take over the region economically, right, with their predatory lending uh, through the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Mm -hmm. So our idea is to have the region uh, rely more on U.S., uh, so Anglo-American uh, partnership that can be uh, uh, very efficient because Anglo-American partnership has done the right thing in 1990. Uh, nine, for example, when Tony Blair and, and, and sure. uh, President Clinton did the right thing in uh, helping the, the, the attempted genocide in Kosovo. But also in terms of being the champions of, of pushing the, reg the region forward. For example, the mm -hmm. European integration of Croatia, most people forgot this, was championed by the British government. Yeah. It was the Blair government that really pushed Croatia closer to the EU than, you know, Germans did their part as well, but it, it was, you know, the French who opposed it at the time and a few other European powers, but the Brits, for example, pushed that through. Mm -hmm. We think that right now is a time to try to offset some of the negative uh, aspects of Russian and German involvement. First aspect mm -hmm. is getting the NATO, new NATO members, uh, uh, um, Macedonia and Montenegro, to uh, have more uh, concrete, more targeted <coughs> support in terms of uh, military cooperation, so mill to mill cooperation between U.S., uh, Britain, and these two countries. Uh, helping Bosnia move along to NATO. Bosnia has just entered MAP, has just sent mm -hmm. its first um, reform program, the annual, uh, annual, program. annual yes, yeah. AMP. Uh, direct military support, to, b budgetary support to Bosnia's military because Bosnia unfortunately froze its military spending in mm -hmm. place in 2012. Mm -hmm. U.S. has done it before. U.S. is still doing it with Egypt and Israel, for example. We're not talking about three billion a year. We're talking about, you know, if U.S. were to give 50 or 70 million uh, dollars a year to the Bosnian military, it would completely change the the uh, the balance, the military balance in the region, mm -hmm. which is now uh, severely uh, strained because Serbia's right. military spending is now four and a half, five times Bosnia's, or no, sorry, seven times Bosnia's. Mm -hmm. Croatia's is uh, similar to that. And it really, the idea under the Dayton Accords was to mm -hmm. keep, keep it in balance. Now, the balance is no longer there. As, as, mm -hmm. as we know, I think it was 94 when I came here as a refugee, and I heard a guy on television. It, it was C-SPAN. It was this guy who was a senator at the time, Joe Biden. And he, sa he was talking about Bosnia. He said the reason there's a war in Bosnia is because the one side is too weak, right? So he mm -hmm. said uh, weakness yeah. invites aggression. So the idea, the idea here is that to, uh, to, to, keep, to make sure that none of the sides are, are too weak. And I do remember the, how the arms embargo favored the stronger party. That, that was the whole weapons. point. And, yeah. and Biden <laughs> was, was, was thankfully the guy who, who actually killed the arms embargo via, via the, the, right. the, the budget. budget uh, there was a line in the budget that kept the Sixth Fleet from, you know, right. it, it, so, so he deleted the line in the budget and the Sixth Fleet could no longer impose the arms embargo. But uh, the idea is to keep the armies strong enough uh, that nobody in the region, especially Serbia, dare think about changing the balance in the region. Mm. Um, another aspect which is very important is the Chinese influence. Chinese influence is mostly focused in the, on the economy, right? And the reason they're able to be so efficient is, is because uh, they actually provide loans for infrastructural projects mm. that are... Uh, Mm -hmm. Quick, right? So, uh, government. If you're in government, right? The, w what you want to do in, in your very short mandate is you want to do something concrete. You want to have results. Mm -hmm. So the Chinese have figured that out and are starting to give money to uh, people in power, mm -hmm. uh, so that they can, uh, you know, have a long-term foothold, a beachhead in the region, right? Mm -hmm. So to prevent that, we're proposing something that we heard at our inaugural event from President Trump's uh, main. Uh, economic advisor, the, the trade person, uh, mm -hmm. Peter Navarro, Dr. Peter mm -hmm. Navarro. So his idea was, which I think makes sense because others, people in Congress, Democrats support this as well, is that we create some sort of quick funding mechanism that we can do jointly with the Brits mm -hmm. that would compete with the Chinese in these, for example, uh, for example, Tuzla power plant, 
we could have done it. Mm -hmm. uh, the Montenegro infrastructural projects, U.S. and uh, the, the Brits could have done it. Mm -hmm. uh, we could have, for example, created incentives for Croatia not to do the bridge, mm -hmm. the Pedeshats bridge, which yeah. is a, a, a very contentious bridge, which is done with EU funding by Chinese this companies. Is contested with uh, Bosnia. Uh, yeah, of course. So, so, yeah. so we can't <laughs> behave. We can't behave like history has stopped, like but, history has ended. But, but let me ask you, the UK, I mean, Brexit hasn't finished. It's just started. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take several years for them to negotiate a new trade agreement with the EU to and negotiate trade agreements with other parts of the world. Do you think London will have the stomach, the appetite to be reinvolved in some way in the Balkans that you're suggesting? Um, US and UK jointly spent less than 0.1% of the money that was spent for interventions in Afghanistan and Iraq for everything they did in the Balkans ever. Mm -hmm. So we're, talking, we're not talking about uh, you know, investment that's, that's going to change uh, a strategic uh, outlook for, mm -hmm. for, for anybody but the region, right? Mm -hmm. So we're talking about very modest mm -hmm. amounts of money that require uh, lots of mil uh, um, diplomatic attention, which, which now there is, anyhow. Uh, that changes the nature of, of the European, uh, uh, Eurasian subcontinent. Mm -hmm. Because uh, Bismarck <laughs> famously said, we, 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 you know, this has been said over and over, yeah. but some damn foolish things in the Balkans will, will, might start a world war. You know, and he said it 67 years before the actual uh, shots were fired in Sarajevo in 1914. So to underestimate the importance of the Balkans has always been extremely foolish. And uh, what the French have done has created a huge vacuum, which can be filled with modest, very modest sums of money uh, by U.S. and U.K. and also will help the U.K. in the Brexit the period of Brexit, right, yeah. which you're talking about, <laughs> in the high uncertainty that, that is before everybody, and not only the UK, it's, it's not, it's not going to be good for the EU either. I mm -hmm. mean, UK is a member of UN Security Council, UK has a considerable sure. military capacity. Uh, it will help UK show that they're still, still relevant and that, that, that they're still a European power. But how will, the, how will UK's absence in the European Union impact on European Union policy in the Balkans? We've already seen France trying to, let's say, fill the vacuum at a time when the German transition is a little bit uncertain, Britain is leaving, uh, Macron, uh, unfortunately, uh, I think in the wrong direction, but France seems to be trying to take a leading role. How will Europe react to any new US, uh, UK, let's say, bilateral initiative in the region? I mean, Europe hasn't reacted. What Macron did was uh, create a vacuum. So what he told people in the Balkans is that you are not entering the EU and you're certainly not entering the EU until we reform the EU from mm -hmm. within. So what he did was very clearly targeted at Berlin. Because let's mm -hmm. face it, since Merkel's election in 2005, mm -hmm. uh, what happened was that Merkel's election coincided with the uh, war in Afghanistan and Iraq going south. So since 05, early 06, U.S. and U.K. have almost entirely pulled out of the region on a day-to-day basis. It was the Europeans running the show. So what we have in the last 15 years is essentially German dominance via Brussels. And Macron said, you know what, enough of that. I'm not going to let you uh, pacify the ball. What the Germans have done, objectively speaking, they've gotten Croatia in, which is what they wanted. And after that, they've sort of pushed the brake and let the region slowly slide towards the, the sort of stasis which they, pre that's their preferred status. Because you have to keep in mind, had the Balkans country, had, had, had Bosnia, had Kosovo or Albania entered the EU, you would have the Muslim majority country, member of the EU, which as Macron very clearly stated in his economist interview, besides mm -hmm. lying about Bosnia being a jihadi, uh, mm -hmm. you know, ticking time bomb, yeah. he said something very interesting that most people missed. He said, we would be one election away from having a government that could be, in terms of values, something that we, we dislike. So his, his, uh, the, the way they see the, the, the Balkans, the, mm -hmm. the, these Western Balkan six countries, <coughs> they see it through, through the Muslim lens. It's a fact. Mm -hmm. We can now delude ourselves. You know, we, we can say, well, you know, we're, we're atheists. You know, we're Albanians first. We're Bosniaks mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. It's not, people in the Balkans don't get to decide how, how, how they're seen by the people in, in Western mm -hmm. Europe. So I don't think that there's, there's much to be lost by uh, doing this, even in terms of EU integration. I think if the U.S. and U.K. do this, the incentives for France and for Germany mm -hmm. to start caring about these countries more goes up. I think it, it, it creates some sort of competition between uh, uh, these two blocks, 
in terms of, you know, what do we give to these people so they can uh, be more, more, more interested in cooperating with us? I want to come back to the U.S. role in a few minutes, particularly on this special envoy question for Serbia and Kosovo. Um, and the spe Matt Palmer Special Envoy for uh, Regional Integration. But let me get back to uh, Macron and the EU Commission, which recently published a new proposal uh, for enlargement strategy in the Western Balkans, um, in which they claim that some could become members as early as 2025. So I think that's a little bit of a, um, let's say, a uh, little bit of a wishful thinking. Is this realistic? Have you looked at this proposal? What is, what is, what is your opinion of it? I mean, I read the proposal as, mm -hmm. as, as everybody else. Uh, the proposal, in reality, is um, rehashing of what we already have, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there were people who were, some of my very good colleagues, who were sort of happy that the proposal wasn't as bad as it would have been had Macron had his way mm -hmm. completely, right? But a proposal changes nothing in, 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 you know, it does not lift the veto. Let me just put it this way. Yeah. So it introduces more veto mechanisms for individual countries yeah. to block accession of the Western Balkans. It could even be reversed, actually. The progress made can even be reversed by individual It EU could countries. even be reversed, yeah. right? So that's another aspect. So mm -hmm. there's the reversibil reversibility mm -hmm. aspect to it. And there's also the fact that there's more uh, ability for individual members to block mm -hmm accession of, of any of the Western Balkan six. So I'm not, I, I think this is what Macron would have liked to have seen three, four years ago, but I don't think it fundamentally changes the, 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 the dynamic. This is about German and French inability to agree on what the EU is going to look like. That's what this is about. Now, the Western Balkans is just a victim of uh, Macron's punishment of Angela Merkel because the, the, the carrot that the Germans have been mm -hmm. holding uh, uh, for the last 15 years alone is now stale. It's, it's, you know, there's mold on it, and that's what that Macron told everybody, there's mold on it, you're, mm -hmm. not gonna, you're never going to get it. Even if you uh, get to eat it ever, it, 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 it will have been rotten by the time you get to uh, actually eat it. So, I mean, looking at the proposal, looking at what the French, this non-paper that the French put out, I think it was in November, uh, it strikes me that it, there are, the sticks are bigger than the carrots. I mean, they're offering some funding if progress is made. But I think, if anything, it seems to create more confusion in terms of what the countries are supposed to achieve over what period of time. Um, there's an additional question over Albania and North Macedonia, which you know didn't get accession invitations, as they expect in October. This is going to be revisited uh, next month in March. Uh, the question I have is, will North Macedonia be given some incentive, in other words, opening the accession, but Albania excluded? The reason they would do that with North Macedonia, with elections coming up in April, a fear that there could be a nationalist backlash against the Preshba Accords, against uh, the European program and so forth. But if this excludes Albania, then we have another problem. In other words, that the possibility that one gets on a faster track if there is a danger of instability in your country. H how do you see this? I don't think there's, a, there's really much chance that there'll be decoupling. I don't see that happening. Mm -hmm. I think the Germans will not want decoupling because if these two countries are decoupled, so if the Northern Macedonians get mm -hmm. what they want and the Albanians don't, then the narrative of we're keeping all the Muslims out will be even stronger. Mm -hmm. I think that's, and, and what, what this does <coughs> is this, this creates even, you know, it, it makes the carrot even, even, even uglier, mm -hmm. right? Uh, as you said, the, the carrot, the, there's less carrot in the French proposal, more stick. But the Germans really, in my view, I mean, I, I could, I'm not... Uh, I'll say it. Mm -hmm. I don't think Germans ever wanted these countries to enter the EU, ever. Because the, since 2006, since mm -hmm. I've seen this in, in the arena in Bosnia, they've done everything to, to, to slow the process down. Because see, you thought that after, you know, after uh, Bulgaria and Romania entered in 07, and then Croatia mm -hmm. entered in 2013, there was simply too much accession, mm -hmm. right? And number two, they don't trust the elites there. Mm -hmm. They think that it'd be very dangerous. Imagine having... Kosovo in the EU with the ability to veto some decisions. So in the German case, what you're saying is it's across the board. It's not limited to, let's say, prejudice against Muslims, uh, uh, Islamophobia, if you like. 
Whereas in the French case, it's it's more directed towards Muslim accession. What I think I think the French are are have a have a mildly Islamophobic president right now. Mm -hmm. uh, there's there's zero doubt that he's been uh, flirting with the far right even in France. Mm -hmm. But their their decision has nothing to do with domestic politics. Mm -hmm. Some of the most notable French experts on the Balkans who were perplexed by Macron's decision have clearly stated that this is not a domestic policy uh, issue. It's not even on the agenda. So mm -hmm. nobody is going to criticize him for allowing the process to go on. Uh, mm -hmm. this, has, this has to do with the longer term uh, strategy that the French have, which uh, he laid out in the Economist interview in which he, I think, mentioned Islam three times and every single time it was negative, right? It was the terrorism in, in the Sahel that he talked mm -hmm. about. It was the fact that he, he thought that Russia's uh, biggest problem was the, the, the so-called southern problem, the southern strategy where the Russian Muslim population mm -hmm. live. And then he talked about Bosnia as being a ticking uh, jihadi time bomb. I mean, this, this type of language we heard about the Muslim populations in former Yugoslavia about Sloboda Milosevic before the genocide. Mm -hmm. Now, I know Macron doesn't care about that because he's my age and he probably doesn't even know that what happened in the Balkans happened. But uh, to, to not see uh, uh, this for what it is, mm. I think, is, is, is delusional. And a lot of my friends, uh, especially in Kosovo, who I respect very much, simply refuse, refuse to see this. Mm. They want to see themselves as primarily, primarily Albanian. And it's, it's perfectly fine, it's perfectly legitimate, and I, I think they are primarily Albanian. But they don't get to choose how they're seen in Europe. That's just a, a mm -hmm. fact of life. So I don't think they'll be decoupling be, uh, of Macedonia and uh, Albania. You think For they'll keep both out? I think that they'll both get a yes, which, which will change nothing in reality. If they both get a yes... It'll be a conditional it yes. It's a yes for a starting accession talks, but with some conditions. Attached. I have a question for you. How long mm -hmm. has Turkey been... Uh, the French have said very clearly, years ago, Turkey will never be a member. No, but the Turks ha had been negotiating for a very long time yeah, before right. Sarkozy did to Turkey the exact same thing that Macron is doing now to Western Balkan 6. So, so, so do you think that reversing the Thessaloniki agreement on the 2003 agreement that all West Balkan countries should become members? No, I mean, the Thessaloniki agreement has been dead for a long time. Mm -hmm. We just didn't want to see it. What Macron mm -hmm. did was he actually just, you know, pulled the curtain and told everybody, I mean, there's mm -hmm. no perspective, that uh, there's no Western uh, Balkan 6 perspective for membership. So should the West Balkan countries continue with the reform programs in order to qualify for the European Union? That's a Union? very, very, I think that's the mother of all questions. That's why I think that the EU, uh, the U.S. and the U.K. can fill this gap, can mm -hmm. come into this area and say, you know what, you guys can be democratic, you can have a, a capitalist economy, mm -hmm. and you can be part of the West. Mm -hmm. And how are you going to be part of the West? Well, you can be friends with us. And we're going to do everything in our power to keep you... Uh, uh, you know, to, to give some sort of hope to people who live there. So That's regardless of EU membership, you're talking but the about. But EU yeah. membership is not on the, uh, uh, mm -hmm. on the table. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it, the EU membership was under a huge question mark even in 2014. I mean, European officials in 2014, very mm -hmm. openly, so when, when this commission that's, uh, that, that's just uh, finished its term, mm -hmm. when this commission took uh, power in 2014, they very clearly stated that there will be no new accession for the foreseeable future, right? If, 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 you know, if it wasn't clear at the time to the elites, mm. I, I, I think it's certainly clear now. So, but NATO, NATO accession is a whole different game. Yeah. Because Americans I'm going to come to, to NATO in a moment. But, but just to continue with the EU, do you think m many of these governments and leaders are extremely corrupt and benefit in a way from not being in the EU? Do you think they really do want to be part of the EU? Or is this just... Um, let's say, a, a, a political spin that they use to attract voters during election times. I, do you think that the Hungarian and Croatian government are not corrupt? I mean, EU, EU mm. membership is not... Uh, we, we, we've seen now that membership, uh, mm -hmm. uh, EU membership does not solve one's fundamental democratic uh, uh, issues, mm -hmm. nor, and, and, and it does not guarantee that there will be no backsliding, because Hungary right now mm. has got serious democratic issues. Croatia's far right is likely the most strongest in Europe and maybe in the world. I mean, mm -hmm. Croatia is, is in such a place that people openly talk about Holocaust not happening. Sure. I mean, this is an official position of, of people who ran that country. This is something that nobody mm -hmm. ever, ever from Brussels condemned. Mm -hmm. And let's not even talk about corruption. Brussels does not deal with corruption. They, they, they pretend it's not there. So I think that uh, we have to find a new framework. 
for tackling corruption. There has to be a new impetus for you know, reforming these societies, bringing them forward. Uh, uh, South Korea is not in the EU. South Korea has changed mm -hmm. its society fundamentally by being a U.S. Uh, uh, ally. Japan did the same. Japan wasn't as industrialized as people think it was in 45. Yeah, I mean, uh, South Korea started off as a very authoritarian, centralized system, but it's become... Exactly, yeah. exactly. Portugal, <coughs> when it entered NATO in 75, Portugal was, was, was not a democratic country. Mm -hmm. Most people forget that. Mm -hmm. Well, neither was Spain. Exactly. Neither was exactly. Greece. Exactly. Neither was Turkey. So. Exactly. So, so you're, let's say, you're very skeptical about any of these countries getting into the European Union in any time frame. I, I presume. Well, I would love, love to be wrong. Mm -hmm. I would love to be wrong. You know, we, I take this clip for f five years from today and say, look, look how wrong I was. Mm -hmm. But I'm afraid I'm not going to be wrong. And I'm afraid people have to start looking for alternatives to uh, a project that's, that, that simply does not include them. Mm -hmm. Bosnians, Albanians, Kosovars, Macedonians, even the Serbs, mm -hmm. Maybe the Montenegrins are the only exception because it's such a small country has a strategic position on the Adriatic coast that, that's very, that's, you know, it, because of a whole different set of uh, uh, issues that have to do with Russia. Maybe Montenegro, Montenegro will get in, right? But the rest of them uh, are simply not wanted. I mean, uh, uh, prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. When was the last time you had a serious European official, so we're talking about either French or German, mm -hmm. say that Western Balkans will enter the EU in the next 10 years? Never. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, uh, these countries have been left in the waiting well, room. Well, Donald Tusk did say on many occasions that we want to see all these countries in the European Union, the well, former you, president. Uh, w you're <laughs> a fellow Slav. You're a fellow, a fellow Slav. You're a no northern, <laughs> northern you know, Polish Slav. And uh, Donald Tusk is a great guy, but Donald Tusk does not... Um, Donald Tusk does not get to set policy in Berlin. No, no, I'm not saying Paris. he did, but you asked me whether an, an official, you, EU official has said that. Th so there, I there are, let's say, so there is support for that in Central Eastern Europe, clearly amongst many of those countries, the newcomers into the EU. Let me turn to U.S. policy towards the Balkans. Uh, how would you describe it under the Trump administration? What has changed from, from the previous, from the Obama administration? I think U.S. policy, thankfully, so far has not been... Um, too different. Mm -hmm. I'd say there's even more uh, attention. That attention might end up being bad if uh, the special envoy for Kosovo and Serbia talks mm -hmm. uh, decides to maybe do the wrong thing. But he's done, he's done okay so far. I think Richard mm -hmm. Grinnell has done so far. Uh, uh, you know, he's has done well so far. Uh, there are two envoys. It's a bit odd, but I think yeah. if you if you look at what they do, I think it's geographically clear that Grinnell. You know, it's the, the areas they, of the Balkans they deal with are, are divided. So Grinnell is in charge of Serbia, Kosovo, while uh, Palmer is in charge, sort of, of, of the, for the rest, of, yeah, the, so the rest region, of the region. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's it's a it was a bit odd in the beginning, but it's clear now what what their roles are. Mm -hmm. Do you think? I mean, you've, you've already jumped in with Grinnell. That was my next question. What did, what are the chances? How do you see his chances of resolving? Kosovo-Serbia dispute, which ultimately the problem is that Serbia refuses to recognize reality, that Kosovo is an independent state and that the final status has been settled. They keep going back on this. Can Grinnell get Serbia over this hump? Uh, I think that pressure on Serbia has been non-existent since 08. So I think since they delivered Karadzic, Serbia has been sort of in this position of, of you know, cruise, you know, cruising towards uh, some sort of uh, embrace with Brussels, right? Mm -hmm. So they supported Tadic very much. Uh, then they supported Vucic very much, precisely because they liked the fact that the region wasn't moving forward too quickly, right? So mm -hmm. Serbia wasn't causing too many problems, right? Kosovo independence wasn't their project anyhow. It was U.S. project. Mm -hmm. But they also at the same time <coughs> wanted the region to be stable. You know, they wanted the people but not the countries. So they like this fact that people are moving to Europe but mm -hmm. the countries are not entering Europe as, as, you know, they don't want the political entities, right? Uh, what changed in the meantime, I think, is that Russia's, uh, uh, Russia's calculus in the region has changed. I think the Russians are now more interested in causing some sort of uh, uh, instability than they were previously. For, I think what, what, their, uh, what their reasons for that are, we can speculate. I don't think we can, we can really know certainly, uh, uh, what, what, you know, with high degree of certainty what Moscow's uh, reasons for, for this new aggressive mm -hmm. approach to the Balkans are. But I think Russians really want to do something. Uh, we saw in, in Montenegro in 2016 when, when they sent 50, this is the first time they used hard power outside of the former Soviet borders uh, since 1989. 
uh, they sent uh, 50 group troops mm -hmm. to Zlatibor, a border <coughs> between Serbia and Montenegro, uh, to help with the coup attempt, mm -hmm. which thankfully failed, right, in 2016. Yeah. There's a hybrid um, attack on Montenegro right now. So Montenegro is under serious hybrid attack right now, uh, which is absolutely linked with, with Moscow, right? Uh, they're trying to push Vucic in this direction of, of helping the uh, uh, whatever is going on in Montenegro. They're uh, raising serious problems in Bosnia via Dodik. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that pressuring Vucic right now can, can bear some fruit because he wants, in my view, he wants to keep ruling Serbia the way he is now, which is, you know, mildly authoritarian, right? Mm -hmm. But he also wants to, to make sure that, that yeah. he can, he can uh, uh, you know, he can keep his Western support because he's got a lot of Western support. That's a fact. Uh, both the Americans and the, uh, and the Europeans are very, very keen on, on, you know, getting Vucic to do the right thing. So I think there's a window now for him to do the right thing so that he can keep the support. Because in my view, Moscow is not going to help him unless he creates something very negative. And if he does go down that road, I think it'll be, uh, I mean, it'll, it'll, it'll be catastrophic for, first of all, the region. It'll be awful for Europe. Uh, but I think Serbia will, will this time around be much more um, punished much more than, than it was in 1990s. Because, in, you know, it took Serbia eight, nine years before it really got punished for, for the genocide in Bosnia, for everything they did in Croatia, for what was about to happen in Kosovo. This time around, things are going to be much quicker because the military balance in the region now is much different than it was in, 2000, uh, in the 1990s. Given that context, how, what would you advise the new uh, government in Kosovo, uh, which you know, only recently in place in terms of its foreign policy, in terms of its approach to these stalled negotiations with Belgrade. What should they do? What initiative should they take? Uh, I mean, the, Kosovo, the, the new government in Kosovo has some very smart people in it. So some people that I know very well personally. Uh, Albin Kurti is, I think, going to be a very uh, wise and prudent uh, uh, leader. Uh, his deputy, prime, deputy PM, uh, Abazi, is going to do, uh, I think, a lot in terms of it, their foreign uh, policy because he, he understands how the world works very well. So I'm not, I'm not certain that, that I can provide the best advice uh, as to how they are going to play their cards. I think they have something in their hands. I think mm -hmm. their cards are not as weak as people uh, tend to think. Mm -hmm. Because uh, ultimately, if this goes on the way... So if, if the West does not help Kosovo more, if there isn't a bigger push on Belgrade, I think the Kosovars can you know, turn around and say, look, uh, you guys are not helping us, right? We're going to start talking to Tirana. Tirana can issue passports. And then that issue, I think, is just, it, it, then it'd be just a matter of time before Kosovo and Albania are, are, are just one country. So, you, in other words, what, what a lot of people have feared, pan-Albanianism would be something that would transpire because all the other options are blocked. Is that what you're saying? In other words... I'm, uh, saying, that, I'm saying that, that, <coughs> that there is that, that card is on the table. And mm -hmm. I think that, car, that possibility is, uh, is likely in case of, of Western indifference to, to, to Serbia's position vis-a-vis -vis Kosovo. Do you think, I mean, going back again to what we were saying about uh, Serbia and the U European Union, Vucic, presumably during this election coming up in April, he's going to be pushing that I'm the guy that can bring you into the European Union. But Juncker the other day in the, during this EU commission, the president proposal talked about we're not going to accept countries that have disputes with their neighbors, which is another stick in a way, visa, potential stick vis-a-vis -vis Serbia. How is that going to impact on, on Belgrade's position? I think it's not going to have any impact. Belgrade has not uh, changed its position uh, on Kosovo's independence one millimeter because of EU integration. Mm -hmm. So Belgrade has been able to come closer to Europe than any of the rest of the region. It's mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the leader uh, for for you know in terms of how, how Brussels see the region they see Belgrade as the leader which I think is ridiculous because Belgrade has done so much to to cause trouble in the region mm -hmm. uh, so you know any sort of any sort of pressure in that sense is not going to change anything because now Belgrade can go back and say you know what there's no such thing as European integration <laughs> because where are we going I mean Macron has told us you know we don't want you um, Germans haven't been too eager to accept us mm -hmm. so why should we change anything because I think any credibility EU had 
until October is now very questionable because of what Macron did. Because Macron has openly told that he just, you know, uh, he pulled the curtains and he said, you guys are not entering the EU. Mm -hmm. And not only that, he also <coughs> gave Serbia the incentive not to go to the EU by providing them with the Mistral uh, air defense weapons. Yeah. Most people actually uh, failed to uh, understand the signific significance of this. If Serbia truly does get Mistral, coupled with what the Russians have given them in terms of air defense, mm -hmm. Uh, it changes the balance, the military balance in the region seriously. What the, the idea is to make any sort of f future Western intervention less likely because Serbia will have had a more formidable air defense. In terms of that brings us directly to NATO, uh, Montenegro, North Macedonia coming in this year. Who's next and when? Well, uh, if you look at w what we have uh, right now, it's Bosnia. So Bosnia has a, has a, uh, a chance to enter NATO in the next seven to eight years. Mm -hmm. uh, if we look at how, how long it took Montenegro, how long it took Albania, how long it took now Macedonia. Macedonia. Yeah, yeah, Macedonia is an is a, is a odd case because of the Greek veto. But mm -hmm. there's a, the there's a potential for that to happen. But what, what can happen in Bosnia and what we're proposing in our paper is that the Brits do what they did in 2018. The Britain did something very good, which I, didn't, I don't think they got enough praise for. They decided to send a, a to reinforce the EU4 mm -hmm. in Bosnia by sending a very formidable gr group, small but formidable group of the Gurkhas, the Gurkhas. Yeah, Nepalese to, fighters. Yeah, yeah, Nepalese fighters, uh, which really showed Moscow and people who were willing to use the 2018 election for uh, the type of trouble that, that Moscow has in store for the region, uh, showed them that, that some NATO members are very serious. And Moscow is not going to challenge, I mean, they, they've never tried to challenge, for example, NATO in, in, in uh, in, in, uh, in Kosovo, mm -hmm. never. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what's happening in Montenegro is a hybrid attack, right? Uh, Bosnia has been under that hybrid attack for, for 30 years. I mean, yeah. that, that, that sort of uh, uh, subversion from within has been happening for a long time. But the institutions are so sclerotic that it's even hard to, to break them apart because they're, they're so calcified, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but what they did in 2014, for example, they, they sent some cultural, you know, the, 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 whatever they call it, Kazakhs, a Kazakh, uh, 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 the, the, uh, it was some cultural group, right, that they sent to, mm -hmm. to Bosnia in 2014 to, to we was actually probably KGB uh, disguised as, 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 you know, cultural. Well, folk uh, dancers. Folk dancers. KGB then, folk yeah, dancers. <laughs> more likely than not. Uh, and the Brits prevented that from happening again mm -hmm. in 2018 by sending their own, uh, mm -hmm. you know, folk dancers. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that can be, that can be made uh, more, more uh, permanent if they decide to send, let's say, 50, 100 soldiers. It's not going to mean much to Britain, mm -hmm. but it would change the balance of the region completely if they, for example, station them in Bercico, which they can do without asking the domestic government because the Chapter 7 mandate is not subject to domestic approval. Uh, that's the beauty of Dayton Accords. So they can mm -hmm. reinforce and make, sort of put Bosnia uh, off the map forever for uh, Russian meddling, w which would then leave Serbia with less cars to play. That would, that would make Vucic less uh, inclined, uh, more inclined to maybe strike a deal on Kosovo independence. Do you think Bosnia faces a new conflict, a new armed conflict? I mean, given uh, Dodik's continuous threats to secede, he's recently left the state institutions, um, uh, whether they're going to hold a referendum on, on secession and depends what support they'll get from Russia, maybe something that Russia would want to see, maybe something that Serbia doesn't want to be pulled into but, but may be pulled into. Do you see that possibility of a, of a conflict over the, the future, the integrity of Bosnia? I mean, the war in Bosnia has been going on for the last 25 years. It's going to be 25 years of Dayton in November. Um, and the war has never stopped. The war has just moved from the battlefield into the institutions, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't, I'm in minority there. I think because of the fact that Dodik is not going to be able to, to destroy the sovereign, and the sovereign in Bosnia is the presidency, mm -hmm. um, I don't see that happening. I think that they will go for a limited conflict if there's a chance of state, state institutions imploding, mm -hmm. meaning what happened in former Yugoslavia, and you, you're old enough to remember this, former, uh, former Yugoslavia, uh, nobody seceded from former Yugoslavia. None of the republics left former Yugoslavia. What happened was in 91, the Budden Terror Commission came after several months of, of looking at what's <coughs> going on and said, you know what, Yugoslavia no longer exists. Mm -hmm. Why did, no longer, why did Yugoslavia no longer exist? Well, the institutions dissolved at federal exactly. level. Exactly. Yeah. So that was, that was Dodik's plan. Dodik's plan was to dissolve the Bosnian institutions, mm -hmm. and they say, you know what? Uh, since there's no Bosnia, there's no more such a thing called Bosnia, mm -hmm. right? How do we know that? Well, the institutions no longer perform their function. Uh, 
meaning there's no presidency. Right. Now I'm I'm declaring independence because there's nothing above me, right? It, it, now as yeah. long as the institutions are there, I don't think he can go for armed conflict because right. the facts on the ground right now, objectively speaking, don't go in Dodik's favor. So if we, if he were to try to do that, I think militarily he'd never he objectively may have no chance to survive. But in terms of institutions, he will also need help from the Croatian side, <laughs> from Trovic and his people. Uh, can they together try and dissolve? as you said, the institution will paralyze institutions at state level. I think they, they, they wanted to do that in 2018. Uh, the, the entire point of Trovich's candidacy was that him and Dodik entered the BIH mm -hmm. presidency, resign at the same time, and then mm -hmm. say, you know what, this country no longer exists exist, because right. the, the, the institutions no longer exist. Mm -hmm. Now, Trovich lost the election to Komšić, thankfully, mm -hmm. which makes this not, uh, they can't do it. It's, it's simply, there's no, physically it's impossible to do. Uh, they might try in 2022, you mm -hmm. know, if, if they, if they, uh, if Hadassi if they, gets back yeah, in. if they yeah. have to have, they gets back into the presidency. Yeah. But what I think is, is very odd is that Croatia has been supportive of Trovic for so long. It is, uh, it is, uh, it is impossible to really, ex uh, to explain this or to understand it. Mm -hmm. Because any new potential conflict in Bosnia will ultimately be more damaging to Croatia's economy than any other country in the region, mm -hmm. because Croatia lives off tourism. I mean, there'll be no tourism in Croatia if there's anything. If uh, there's a war in Herzegovina, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it will be. <laughs> As we saw in Bosnia. the 90s. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But, but what is, I mean, we have a new president now in Croatia. Do you think the policy will change? I think the new president is, um, a right-wing social democrat. Mm -hmm. So I think he will do as much to help Hadeze as uh, the, uh, the previous administration did, but I don't think he'll do it as eagerly. Mm -hmm. I think he, he's, because they don't vote for him. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't like him, they'll never vote for him, despite him being, objectively speaking, a nationalist. Uh, I don't think he'll, he'll, he'll do what, what Kolinda did. I mean, uh, the, the previous president, Tro uh, Grabar Kitarovic, was uh, so uh, so interested in causing trouble in Bosnia that really she, she, she went against Croatia's best interest. As a matter of fact, what Macron said mm -hmm. uh, about Bosnia being a jihadi uh, time bomb directly, it came directly from her. That This is a, 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 a sentence she used first, yes, which was right. ridiculous. I yeah. mean, everybody has denied it, yeah. and there's, there's zero proof of that. Mm -hmm. But th there's an axis between, so Croatia, so Zagreb, Dodik, Moscow, Trovic, mm -hmm. are one axis. You, you can think of them as one sort of grouping in terms of uh, Watch what, what this goes space. on in Bosnia. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, Ralph, because we don't have a lot of time on, one other question I wanted to, to pick your brains about, and that's this whole mini Schengen arrangement that uh, Vucic and Rama have been pushing Kosovo and Montenegro, have, you know, as you know, have been a bit resistant. They say, well, SEFTA is already in place, the Central European Free Trade Agreement. Why build something new? Is this going to be a, a substitute for the real Schengen? Uh, what is your view? What is your view of this initiative? Uh, the small Schengen idea, I think, was um, the intentions were good. Mm -hmm. I think people that uh, decided to, to try to do something like this had very good intentions. Mm -hmm. But the downsides were so pronounced that, as you said, two countries that matter a lot in the region, Montenegro and uh, Kosovo, decided not to be a part of it. So uh, I, can, I can say that I understand some of the reservations that the uh, Montenegrin government has, and they're likely justified. Uh, the region has to cooperate. There has to be some sort of framework where people uh, uh, work together especially in terms of the economy, but then there's SEFTA, as, as they say, there is mm -hmm. already something like that. So I would not read too much into this, uh, into this initiative. Uh, Serbian government is, is, is likely, the, w w would have been the biggest beneficiary of this, and I, I agree mm -hmm. with, uh, with some of my Kosovar and Montenegrin friends when they say this, but uh, no, I don't think this, this would have changed anything, honestly mm -hmm. speaking. It was a good idea, you know, some people didn't like it, so it's not going to happen. Right. Uh, but uh, I, don't, I would not read too much. I think uh, a, bi a much bigger deal was made out of something that, that was just one of many initiatives. Okay. Okay, Ralph, thank you very much. On that note, I think we'll, thank you. we'll take a break just then. We'll have you back at some point. This isn't going to go away, and I think these problems are going to continue. I mean, one of the things I do want to consider with you at some future uh, discussion is the role of outside powers. Mm -hmm. You already mentioned China mm -hmm. and Russia, but also Turkey. Middle Eastern countries and so Saudi Arabia and so forth. All right.
Anyway, thank you very much and good luck in your, in your initiative. Thank the, you very much. Particularly nice. the UK-US initiative. Thank you. We'll stop now for a few ads. Unfortunately, we have already come to the end of today's show. I have greatly enjoyed being with you, with my colleagues at RTK. Good night, everyone. Stay healthy, be productive, and remain optimistic. See you all very soon. Mirupafshim. Thank you.